Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, tutorial on creating a Fruit Ninja replica inside of Unity. This is a live stream recording, so if there's any mess ups along the way, you know why. All right, this is what we're going to be making today. It is, of course, Fruit Ninja inside of Unity. And you can see that I can slice through these watermelons and it looks pretty decent. There's, of course, a lot of need for some fruit variants, some particle effects, all that fancy stuff. And it's especially maybe a, a score counter. Um, but you can see the base mechanic is in here. We have the cutting, we have the um, cutting in two, uh, which is basically what the game is all about. This satisf satisfying feeling of get to getting to slice some fruits. And that's what we're going to be doing today. So without further ado, let's actually just jump right into it. And towards the end, we'll do a QA. and a That's going to be super fun. All right, let's get into it. So, uh, whoops. That's the wrong mode. What I want to do is go ahead and create a new Unity project. And uh, I'm just going to call this one the Fruit Ninja Replica. And let's make this... Um, do I want 3D here or 2D? I'm actually going to select 3D because our graphics are 3D. Um, but I've actually made all of the colliders in 2D. And so, yeah. But let's just select uh, 3D for now. And we can hit Create Project. And this is just going to boot everything up. Uh, the version of Unity I'm using right now is 5.6.2, I believe. Yep, you can definitely do this in 2017.1 and probably .x. We aren't going to be uh, uh, using that advanced functionality, so it shouldn't change, I don't think so. Cool, so the first thing that we want to do here is to go to our main camera and change from skybox to solid color and maybe just get some kind of solid brown in here and of course brown isn't the most pretty color but it, i believe that's kind of what we associate with the game so that's what we're going to put there and then we can also create right click go 3d object and create a sphere and this is of course going to be our watermelon so we can go in here and call this the watermelon and uh, by default we definitely just want to reset this on the transform and we can maybe Actually, I think the scale is fine here. Maybe go down to 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8. See that in the game view, that looks fine. On our main camera, I want to go out of perspective mode and instead go to or or orthographic. And that's because we aren't going to have any perspective on this. We're going to be viewing everything from the side. And really, it's going to be pretty much like a 2D game, except the individual fruits are rendered in 3D. And that will allow for some nice rotation and make it look pretty good when we slice them. I believe that's what is being done in the original game as well. So that's why we're, uh, we'll be doing things in orthographic. We'll be having all of our colliders be two-dimensional colliders. We'll be using 2D rigid bodies, having all of the code in 2D. Everything is going to be, have a Z position of zero but the graphics are indeed going to extend into 3D space. So we can also switch into 2D mode here to have a look at everything. And let's actually take our camera here and zero that on the Y as well, so that now our watermelon is in the direct center of our screen. And what I wanna do here is basically just get rid of pretty much everything. What I wanna do is separate out our gameplay from our graphics. So let's actually just call this one our graphics let's right click and create another empty let's reset this as well and actually this is what i want to scale so let's do 0 0.8 0 0.8 0 0.8 on this one and then this one could be 1 1 1 we can drag our graphics under our game object we can remove our sphere collider on the graphics and on the game object we can add all of our gameplay play related code so we'll call this one the watermelon and under our watermelon we'll have the graphics with only a mesh renderer then on our watermelon oops and we have to reset the transform here okay so this is 111 and this is 0.8 cool see this is what happens in the live stream we do <laughs> confuse things a little bit and change our minds but that's okay so now we can add a component here and what i want to add is a rigid body 2d and i do want this to be simulated so right now if we hit play we can see that this drops and that's totally fine and we also want to go ahead and add a circle collider 2d now we can see this in our scene view i believe you can see there's a tiny green line here but especially if we go to game and enable gizmos we can see the green line being drawn here and that's our circle collider and we can see that has a matching radius 
all ready. So that's all fine and dandy. The next thing that we want to do is add some kind of slicing, some way to kind of create a blade that starts where we click and ends when we release our mouse button. And anywhere in between, we want to have this cool trail that follows it around. But we don't want to just be able to click on an object and have it disappear. We want to have to slice it. So we need some way of also checking for velocity. So these different things we'll try and define as we go. In the beginning, let's just start by creating an empty game object. Let's reset the transform on this and let's call it our blade. Here we can go add component and create a blade. And um, wait a second, I'm just seeing someone saying the screen is black. Okay, I think it's only a single person, that's good. <laughs> so um, we'll create a script called blade here and we'll choose C-sharp, hit create and add. Let's double click this to open it up in Visual Studio. And while that's opening, we can actually go in and also save. No, we can't do two things at once. We have to be patient. So this is where, okay, so this is uh, the script in Visual Studio. I just want to go in and save our scene here as main uh, because I'm going to be saving all the time. So it's nice to have it in a saved scene. Now inside of our blade script here, we want to delete our start method but we do want to keep our update. That's because we'll use our update to check for input. So inside of update here, we'll see if we get a mouse button down. So if input.get mouse button down, and the mouse button that we want to check for is the left click. So that means zero, zero for left, one for middle, I think, and two for right. So we'll do zero for left here. And when we press our button, well, then we want to start cutting. And this is a method we'll create in just a second. Then we can do else if input dot get mouse button up. And that means we've just released the mouse button. Again, we want to check for the left mouse. And if we have it, then we want to stop cutting. Cool. And uh, we can now go ahead and create these two methods. We'll create a void start cutting and a void stop cutting. And basically what we want to do here is have some kind of variable that determines whether or not we're currently cutting. So let's create a boolean up here, a bool called is cutting, and we'll default that to false. Then when we start cutting, we set is cutting to true. And when we stop again, we set is cutting back to false. That means now that if we go and select our blade and we switch into debug mode here to allow ourselves to see a private variable, we now hit play and when I click, we can see that it changes to true. When I release, it changes back to false. Awesome. So what we can do now is make sure to update the position of a blade to follow our mouse around whenever we're currently cutting. To do that inside of our update, we'll check if we're currently cutting. So if is cutting, well then we want to say update our cutting. To do that, or update our cut or update our blade. I don't know the terminology here. Update cut is fine, I think. So we'll do a void update cut. And in here, we'll set our current position equal to that of our mouse button. But one thing that people often do, I see, is they change the position of an object without having a rigid body on it. And even though you're not using uh, the built-in functions for adding force and all of that, it's still really nice to add a rigid body to any object that you're moving. It's actually something that Unity themselves recommend you do because it allows Unity to know this object is going to be moving and therefore will apply some optimizations behind the scene to, uh, because we now know that this object will move. So we'll go ahead and add a component here, a rigid body 2D component, and we'll use this to move around our blade. We'll also make sure to change the body type to kinematic just to make sure that it won't fall and be affected by forces or anything like that. So now let's get a reference to our rigid body. We'll go rigid body 2D and call it RB. Then we'll create a start method and in here we'll set RB equal to get component of type rigid body 2D. So now that we have a reference to our rigid body, we can actually change the position of it by going rb.position and set this equal to whatever. 
Now we want to set this equal to our current mouse position. To do that, we'll go input dot, oh, I'm sorry. We'll go, um, yeah, input dot mouse position. Awesome. This is our current mouse position, but this is in screen coordinates. So this is actually going to be much, much larger values than what we want. We want to convert this into world coordinates. To do that, we use camera dot screen to world point. But in order to use that function, we need a reference to our main camera. So let's go up here and let's create a camera. Let's call it cam. And in our start method, where we're also caching our rigid body, we'll set cam equal to camera dot main. Then down here, we can set, we can call cam dot screen to world point, and we'll give it our input dot mouse position. And that should actually fix everything for us. So if we now hit play here, hit play, and try and click, you can see that our blade is moving around, at least if we have a look at our transform up here. But we can't visibly see it. So let's take our game view and dock it to the side here of our scene view. Let's switch into the movement tool here by hitting W. So now we can see the current position of our blade. And you can see as I click and drag around the screen, this object will follow our mouse. So we've actually already created a very, very big part of the functionality of our game. We can now move around this object. And that means that we can easily apply effects to it. We can add a trail to it right away. There's only one problem with that, and that is we want sometimes to display multiple trails on screen. Because we might have an, instant, have an instance where we do a slice and begin another one before the other slice has stopped animating, meaning that the trail is still visible on the screen. And so we actually want to instantiate in a trail each time. But just while testing here, we can put a trail on our blade. Let's hit add component, let's create a trail, create a trail renderer, and um, actually an even better idea here is create another empty under our blade here. So we separate it out into game objects. And this is going to be our blade trail, blade trail. And here we'll add a trail renderer component. Then on this trail renderer, we can actually configure some different properties. Let's just hit play here. Let's try moving around our blade and you can already see our trail drawing and Let's now pause the game. You can also hit Control Shift P to pause it. And let's go over here and have a look at some of these parameters. The first one we want to change is the width. We can bump this down to say 0.1. We also want a bit of rounding towards the edges here. And uh, we can change that by going to end cap vertices and bumping that up to three. You can see that kind of rounds it off. Then we also definitely want to change the color here. So let's go and create a new material. And we'll call this one our blade trail. And uh, we can then select our blade trail and under the materials, we can drag in our blade trail material. So you can see now it's not drawing in this purple, no material assigned color. We can also change the shader of our material to say a sprite default. That will just make it draw with a single color of our choosing. And we can now change the color down here. But before we do that, we might want to decrease time because right now the trail stays active for a long time, as you can see here. We probably want to bump this down to something like 0.1. Now you can't see it on the screen. So let me just show you what that looks like. That's already a lot better. Let me just create a quick trail here. And um, let's also try and maybe fade it out a little bit. So here under our color, under the gradient editor, Let's make sure to add, actually, let's just have it fade from an alpha of zero to an alpha of 255. So let's have this one be zero and this one be 255. And you should now see that it fades out the closer or uh, the farther away from the mouse it is. And we now get this nice slicing effect. That's pretty fast actually to do because of Unity's awesome trail renderer. So let's now right click on this, hit copy component. Let's stop playing, right click again and hit paste compon component values. And we ha now have every time we play the game, this awesome trail. You can also see that actually this is barely visible, but you will sometime have some weird rendering if we click really quickly like this. It might not be too visible, but it's definitely noticeable and I don't like it one bit.
So what I think we should do instead is instantiate in these blade trails. To do that, let's drag them out of our blade object and let's uh, make a prefab out of it by dragging it into a project panel. Let's remove it from our scene. And now inside of our blade script here, we'll open that up. And when we start cutting, we want to create a blade trail. So at the top here, we first off want to create a public game object where we can reference our blade trail prefab. So blade trail prefab. And then down here, we can instantiate it. So instantiate blade trail prefab. And we want to parent it to our current blade object. So we can just set the parent here to our transform. Now, we definitely don't want this to stay parented. Of course, we want it to be removed at some point. And in fact, we want to deparent it as, stop, as soon as we stop cutting. So to do that, we need first a reference to the object that we're instantiating. We can get that very easily by going up here and creating a private variable. We'll also make this of type game object and let's just call it the current blade trail. And then down here we can set current blade trail equal to the instantiated object. Then when we stop cutting, we can set current blade trail dot transform dot set parent to null. And now we should see that um, when we save this and go into Unity, we get a field for the blade trail prefab. Let's drag in our prefab here. And when we now save this, and when we do a slice, you can see that it's quickly parented. As long as I hold down the mouse button here, it's parented to our object. And as soon as I let go, it disappears. So it's unparented again. However, it currently just stays in the scene. And the, many, the more slices we do, the more objects we're going to have cluttering our scene and that's not really wanted. So let's just make sure to remove this again after X amount of seconds. So when we stop cutting, we deparent it immediately and then we destroy current blade trail after say two seconds. And now we should see that when we hit play and create a bunch of trails after X amount of setting, second, <laughs> seconds if after two seconds in fact uh, each blade will disappear awesome so now we have this cool graphic but we currently have no way of detecting whether or not we sliced a watermelon in order to do that we need to also have some kind of collider let's go in here and add a collider and what we want to add is a circle collider 2d again remember we're doing everything when it comes to physics in 2d and I'm going to decrease the radius here to say 0.1. So it has the same width or around the same width as our trail. I think that works pretty well. Then what we can do is make sure to disable this circle collider and then only enable it when we're actually slicing. So inside of our script, we'll need a reference to it. Here we'll create a, um, another private variable here, which we'll call our circle collider 2D. We'll just call it circle collider. And then in the start method, we'll set circle collider equal to get component of type circle collider 2D. Then when we start cutting, we set circle collider dot enable to true. And when we stop cutting, we set circle collider dot enabled back to false. So now we should see that when we hit play, we currently cannot see our circle collider because it's disabled. As soon as I start cutting, you can see it gets enabled over here. We can also see it in the uh, scene view if we expand this here. And then when I stop cutting, it disappears again. So that's already closer to what we want. So now we can only actually hit objects or detect collision on, on objects whenever we are cutting. But there's a slight problem and that is no matter the speed that we're currently cutting with, this circle collider is always going to work. And also, um, if we just click, we can see the circle collider appearing. And we don't want that. We only want this circle collider to be enabled when we are actually slicing. So when we've actually done a gesture and when we actually have some velocity on our mouse. To do that, we need to go in here and define or some define some way of checking our velocity. And rigidbody actually has a method for this. If we go rb dot um, velocity, we can get the current velocity of the rigidbody. 
but our rigid body is set to kinematic. And as far as I know, at least, a kinematic uh, rigid body will always have a velocity of zero. So we have to define our own way of doing this. And we'll do that in just a second. I'm just going to have, first of all, a sip of water. And I'm also going to have a look in the chat. Let's see here. Everything is good. Um... Couldn't you now get rid of your is cutting variable and just check for activity of the collider? Definitely. That's totally something that you could do. But again, the collider here is going to be enabled in a different way now. And so that wouldn't work too well. And also it's sometimes cleaner to add a bit more code for in, uh, or in exchange for readability. That's at least something that I like to practice when I'm coding for myself. Um, will this live stream be on YouTube? Yes, it definitely will. And uh, yeah, everything is, uh, is looking good. So let's go ahead and continue. So we need some way of checking our velocity. And but what velocity or speed, as it's sometimes referred to, but velocity is the more correct term, what velocity really means is distance traveled over time. So what we can do is keep a variable or have a variable keep track of our position on the last frame and then compare that to the position in our current frame and then multiply that with time dot delta time because we're doing this in the update method and what that will essentially do is give us our current velocity it's going to give us the speed at which we're moving because we're having a look at our distance traveled over a certain amount of time so let's go up here and create a uh, variable let's call this our uh, let's say we'll put it here and we'll make it of type vector 2 and we'll call this our previous position then inside of our update cut method here we can get our new position so let's actually store this here in a vector 2 called new position and we can then set rb.position equal to new position. And then we can say, um, or we can get our velocity, so float velocity, by going on new position minus our current previous position, yes, and then dot normalized, no, dot magnitude, of course, yeah. All right, brain fart. I'm sorry, everyone. So here we are getting a vector, which is the difference between our new position and our previous position. And we're getting the length of that vector. And that is going to be the speed at which we're traveling. So we'll store that in a variable of type float called velocity. And we can then check if velocity is greater than some kind of number. So if we are traveling, or if our mouse is moving faster, the previous frame, to now, then some kind of fixed value, well, then we are, can go ahead and slice. I and mean, if it's not, well, then we sh probably shouldn't do the slicing. So we can here make some kind of float. Let's create a public float up here, which we'll call the min uh, cutting velocity. And we can set that equal to some very small number here, which is going to say 0 0.001, I think it's going to be kind of the area we're looking for. Might be off with a factor 10. Um, but that's okay. And uh, inside of our if statement here, we can now check if velocity is greater than our um, min cutting velocity. And if it is, well, then we want to slice. But remember, we also have to multiply here with time dot delta time because we're doing this inside of the update method and we don't, and we want our velocity to scale. We don't want our velocity to change just because of our frame rate. So yeah. So now, if this is indeed true, well then we have judged <laughs> that our velocity is great enough for us to do some cutting of some fruits. And that means that we can enable our collider. So we can set circle collider uh, dot enable to true. If it's not, well then it's not fast enough and we want to set our circle collider to uh, dot enable to false. So else here, circle collider dot enable equals false. Then right when we start cutting, we want our circle collider to not be enabled because we don't want it to be enabled on the very first frame. Right when we click, 
we're not going to have a velocity, so we'll just disable it. And we'll do the same thing down here when we stop cutting. We also want to make sure that circlecollider.enable is false. Now we should see if we save that and go into Unity and hit play. And hopefully if I don't have any errors, we should see and we're not seeing, which is making me mad. We're not seeing what I want here. Maybe it's just because of, I'm off by a number. Definitely doesn't look like it. So we can see that it is correctly disabling, but it's also enabling as soon as we click. And that is annoying. If I go ahead and bump up this value, what do we get? Okay, so it's working if I bump it up. So it was probably just because of a zero too much somewhere. Let's see now here. So I click and here it's for some reason right away. All right, guys, this is chat time. Please let me know what's wrong with my code. <laughs> Let's see here. So um, so we go in here, reset circle collider done enabled to false. We um, do the same thing when we stop cutting. Then every um, frame, every time we update our cut, we set our velocity equal to the difference in position. So our new position minus our previous position, which should be fine, that magnitude, we multiply that with time to delta time. And that means that we get um, to check if our velocity is greater than our minimum cutting velocity. If it is, we set our collider to true. And we, if it's not, we set it to false. I don't see the problem here. Oh, of course, I'm not setting previous velocity. Jesus. Okay, so instead of our update cut here, we have to then, after doing all of this uh, stuff, we have to set previous position equal to new position. And there we go. Of course, we always have to update our previous position or it's just going to be the same value, which is just zero, zero, zero. And so it was working all the time. So now we should see that, yeah, so you can see here, right when I click, it's disabled. And when I'm moving it at a slower speed, it's not enabled, but then as soon as I shake it really quickly, we can see that I get an enabled collider. So we just have to bump this number down here. So to make it easier to do the cutting. So now we should see, and this is actually a pretty good value, I think. So at this slow pace, it's not working, but then as soon as I go a bit faster, we can see that it's enabling. So now it will only be enabled when we do actual cutting. Yes, it's working. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, celebration. Okay, I, I can't do too much singing, singing here because I don't want my audio to get ripped out of the thing, but <laughs> hey, that's awesome. So um, yeah, so now that this is working, uh, one thing that we do have to be a bit careful about, I think, is that right when we click in one place and go to another, it quickly enables in the previous location. So what can we do to fix that? Well, then inside of our start cutting, we want to kind of reset our previous position because we're using the previous position of a previous time we cut, and that's not a good idea. Instead, we want to have our previous position start at the place where we start cutting. And so here we can simply set previous position equal to, and then we do the cam dot, um, green to world point and we take in our mouse position and there we go it's not the prettiest of code but if we hit play now we should see that if we cut over here and then click here our circle collider doesn't teleport in a weird way it just yeah just snaps over and that's just fine so now our cutting should actually be working and all we have to do now is create fruits that register whenever this circle collider meets them and then gets cut in half. So that's kind of the exciting part, I guess, but yeah, it's also probably the easiest. So before we do that, I'm just gonna check the chat here. Uh, what version? Unity 5.6.2, as it says in the corner here. And um, let's see, you can definitely do this in 2017, um, which is an awesome version, by the way. I've been using it a little bit. It's it's great. And uh, yeah, I think most of the contents of the chat here will have to wait too. Uh, we get to Q&A. And some guy is saying exploding fruit. Yeah, you could definitely make the fruit explode. Just add in some nice forces and a cool particle effect and you can have exploding watermelons all day. 
Cool. So what we want to do here is probably bring in a bit nicer of a graphic. Let's do that now. So I have prepared a 3D model. That's right, guys. I did some 3D modeling myself. And um, I think it's... Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it AAA, but I would call it really, really good. So let's drag in the models folder here and I will make sure to upload this on GitHub for you to have a look at when I also upload the entire project, um, which I will do when the live stream is done. Don't worry, I will have it uh, available for you to have a look at. But this is basically just a sphere with a color. But just in case, you know, you want, you know, for some reason you want to use my models. Um, so. Uh, by default here we can see that we have two models we have a watermelon and we have a watermelon sliced the watermelon is a sphere the watermelon sliced is two half spheres so let's select these two let's go and uh under rig hit none we don't want any animation and on the model here we can set the scale factor of both of them to 0.5 and i do believe we have to do this one at a time don't ask me why apply and now if we drag in our watermelon here, and let's actually just drag it right under our watermelon object, you can see that that snaps to the exact same size as our uh, graphics. I'm just gonna remove our graphics now. And here is our watermelon, the glorious watermelon. And then our sliced version is right here. And I'm just gonna set the scale of this to 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8 as well. And you can see here that it consists, if I snap out of 2D mode here, of two watermelon slices. A, C, almost triple A. And uh, I'm just gonna disable this now and then we'll return to that one later. For now, we just have to first off kind of register some input. I'll also go in here and maybe play around with the lighting a bit. I definitely wanna bump up the uh, ambient light to two and then maybe the directional light down to say 0 0.7. Let's just try maybe even 0 0.6. That's nicer just to give a, a bit more fill light so we don't get that much. We don't really need to have the big lighting effects here. We just have everything be kind of cartoony. So we have a watermelon and uh, we'll just rename this to graphics again. And then this is our watermelon. Cool. On our watermelon object, we already have a circle collider. Let's go ahead and set this to trigger. Let's go ahead and add a component called fruit. It's going to be a new C sharp script, create an add and reload on that one. And let's open it up in Visual Studio. Now here we want to have a method that is called whenever we detect something entering our trigger. Unity has a callback method for that, of course, called on trigger enter. And this is a 2D collider, so we put 2D. Then we can get some information about the collider that we hit by going collider and calling it call. And we can check if call.tag is equal to some kind of tag. Let's just check for a blade tag here. And let's just go in and add this right away. So let's select our blade. Let's under tag, go add tag. List is empty here. We'll go blade. And we'll add that back to the object. And I think... Oh, of course, yes. This has to be a collider 2D. Cool. So if the object that we hit has a tag of type blade, well, then we can throw out a debug.log message saying something like, we hit a watermelon. And we can also destroy it. So destroy game object. Hit play. Do some quick slicing. Oh, I barely hit it. We hit a watermelon and it, it got destroyed. Let me just try that once more. Whoa. Awesome. So that's already working. Now we just have to do the actual slicing in two. And that's all about just instantiating in these slices and having them kind of do some physics-y stuff. So in order to do that, we'll create a public uh, game object. And this is going to be our water. Uh, let's call it the fruit sliced prefab because we want to have multiple types of fruits here. And uh, bef right before we destroy this object, we go ahead and instantiate our sliced fruit. So we'll go instantiate fruit sliced prefab. Awesome. And that should actually be it. So now when we hit, oh, of course, we also need to reference this. So on our watermelon, we now can put in a fruit sliced prefab. 
let's just disable our watermelon here and let's have a look at our sliced watermelon instead. So what we want to do here is first of all probably rotate this a bit. So we want to rotate it in such a way that our forward vector here, so if we just point that upwards, so now our forward vector, the blue arrow, points upwards, well then our watermelon, our slices here, whoops, what am I doing? Our slices, Jesus, this is all messed up. This needs to be negative 90. Cool. So now they are aligned. We can now rotate this around the X, negative 90. Cool. So now it points upwards. And that means that our slices should, or our cut, should do that as well. So we'll switch into pivot and global. And now we can, oops, can rotate. Why does it keep doing this? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I keep messing up this rotation, please. So now we, um, I messed it up. Local, good. So these, so the cut here, okay, should be rotated. This is not working, guys. <laughs> That's why, okay. We need it to be in center and not in pivot mode. Cool. So, what I was trying to say is if we select that watermelon, have a look at the forward vector. This is currently pointing up. We want our cut to be aligned with that, like we sliced it down from above or uh, from above to below or the other way around. Because then we can simply make sure to always orient our watermelon in such a way that it points towards our mouse, and that means that it should in most cases be sliced in the direction that we cut. And that looks a lot better than just instantiating a random position and have it kind of not line up. So that's what we'll try and do. There is a slight issue with this and I'll show you what that is, but it shouldn't matter too much, especially not uh, if you put in some particles later. So now that we have our sliced watermelon here, we can actually turn this into a prefab. So let's drag this down into our project and let's remove it from our scene. We can then take our watermelon, add it back in, and now we'll reference our fruit slice prefab as the watermelon sliced. However, if we just go ahead and throw in our watermelon sliced here and hit play, you can see not much happens. We want this to be more exciting. One way to do this is using simple physics. So let's go under our two spheres here and let's add a rigid body to each. And yes, now I am using a three-dimensional rigid body. And that's because I want the physics interaction of these different slices to be in 3D space. I think that looks a lot cooler and allows us to use other types of colliders. That also means that we can now add a box collider. There we go. And we can now maybe move these two spheres a bit closer to each other. That should mean that automatically now when we hit play, hey, they clash together and they kind of open up the fruit in a way that it would do if we just sliced it. And we didn't have to do any coding whatsoever. You could of course also animate this statically, but I think it's a lot cooler to have this be part of the physics system. Because that now means that if you slice fruits close to each other, they might collide and do weird stuff, which looks super cool. And it's also what we see in Fruit Ninja. So if we now apply these changes to the prefab, hit play, and oops, of course we also have to re-enable our watermelon. Let's also drag this up, hit play, and if we now slice it, yeah, nothing, nothing did happen there, did it? Let's try that one more time. Okay, so something definitely happened. So we're definitely instantiating this fruit slice prefab, but we also have to do that at our current position. So we'll go in here and set transform uh, or set the position to our current position, which is transformed a position. And we can also for now just set the rotation to our current rotation. So now when we hit play and slice it, Jesus, okay, I have to make this static, guys. I'm sorry, but I cannot freaking aim. So let's put that to kinematic. And now when we hit play and slice it, you can see that it instantiates our watermelon sliced. But the direction in which we slice it doesn't really matter. So we definitely have some weird behavior there. To fix this, what we'll do is, um, 
We'll do that in a sec. First, I actually want to instantiate in the fruits so that we have them jumping around. And then we can fix the other issue because I do believe that kind of make things a lot easier. Ah. No, let's do it now. Yeah, let's do it now. One second. Just have a bit of water. Sophia just looked at me being like, you should do it now. <laughs> um, so I'll do that, uh, which is also a much better idea because we can see it more clearly from here. Okay, so um, basically what we want to do is rotate this watermelon or this sliced version of the watermelon to point towards our cursor. Because when we are sliding this here, so right when we impact it, that would normally be here. We can then simply rotate, if I take the watermelon slice here, so if we are hitting it here, we can then simply have it rotate so that our blue arrow points in this direction. So in our case, that would look something like this, and so we would be slicing it in the correct direction. If we try and do that, what we can do is use the collider info we have right here. This is the current position of our mouse, because the collider that is hitting this fruit is at the same position as our mouse. So what we could do is get the direction from uh, our collider or from this fruit here to the collider. So we can go in here and create some kind of vector to direction and set it equal to our colliders. Actually, we should probably do vector three here, vector three direction and set it equal to the fruits position minus our colliders position. And if we want to point from the fruit to the collider, we'll have to reverse it. So cold.transform.position minus our transform.position. This is now the direction. And we do definitely have to normalize this. So we'll just wrap it in some parentheses and call dot normalized. Then we can use quaternion dot look rotation. And this takes in a direction to look at and it outputs a rotation. So the direction we want to look at is our direction vector. And we can simply store this in a quaternion called rotation. Then instead of inputting transform.rotation, we'll input our rotation. Cool, let's save that, go into Unity and hit play. And we should now see that when we slice through it, that definitely did not work. <laughs> so I think we have a, we're kind of off by a 90 degree angle here. Uh, and that's just because of the way that um, uh, that look rotation orients everything. So I think all we have to do is kind of rotate this around the I, around the Y by 90 degrees. And uh, this is only a theory. So let's try it out. Yes. Awesome. So we should now see that when we hit play, and choose a direction to uh, slice it from. Let's just try this one. That the cut goes the right way. And that's the same thing if we slice from the other side here, that our cut is somewhat, <coughs> looks somewhat precise. This is great because it really makes everything feel more realistic. One thing that is off is if we slice right at the edge here, you can see the cut still lies in the center and it will actually put the cut in reverse direction. And the reason why is that if we are slicing, I'm just going to zoom in here. If we are slicing right at the right through the edge of our collider here, the point of impact is actually going to be here. And so when we get a direction from the center to here, we actually get a cut this way. That's why this is not the optimal way to do things. However, I do think this is not a huge issue. When you're going through and slicing a lot of fruits, you probably aren't going to be noticing this a whole bunch, especially after you add effects. But if you want to fix this, the way would probably be getting or using the same technique that we do for getting our velocity. Because this here says something about how our mouse is traveling. When we are subtracting our previous position from our new position, we're actually getting a vector pointing from our new position to our previous position. Yes. <laughs> and that means that you can actually use that as the direction vector for the fruit to face. I'm just not going to be doing that here because it's a longer explanation and this is a live stream and I wanted to get this to work and we still have more stuff to do, but 
that is probably the way to go about it. Get the general direction in which your mouse is traveling and use that as the direction for the cut. But this is kind of a hacky way and it looks pretty nice most of the time. Cool. So we'll just use that for now. One thing that I also want to do is probably just take our watermelon slice here and actually rotate it all the way around. There we go. Just because I noticed that it was more often falling to the other side and I want that effect. So let's just try it. Now it opens up more nicely so we can actually see what's inside. Cool. So let's take our watermelon, let's change it back to dynamic and let's make a prefab out of this. Now it's time to create a spawner for these, uh, for these fruits. Let's right click, go create empty and let's call this our fruit spawner and let's reset the transform on it. And before we do it, I'm going to have a look in the chat. Okay, so people are actually still here even through that slicing explanation. <laughs> that kind of surprises me. I'm sorry if that got a little hairy, uh, but it's kind of an essential part of the game. So I guess I had to leave it in there. Um, but yeah, you guys enjoying the stream? Looks like it. That's awesome. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Hope that you guys have some interesting questions prepared for this time. And also want to talk to you a bit about uh, kind of what we're doing um, the, press, uh, the, the past couple of weeks and, and what's been going on. So let's get back into it. So let's select our fruit spawner. Let's hit add component. Let's create a fruit spawner script. Hit create an add and let's open this up. And um, the first thing that we want to do here is create a reference to our fruit. So for now, this is just going to be a simple fruit or a single fruit. And that's going to be our watermelon. But you can easily turn this into an array and simply get a random element in that array. I'll show you how to do that with spawn points. It's going to be the exact same thing with fruits. So a public game object and we'll call this our fruit. Then we also have a public game object array, and this is actually going to be a transform array called spawn points in plural. Then at the start of our game, we're going to go ahead and call a coroutine. So we'll create a coroutine, an I enumerator, and uh, we'll call this something like spawn fruits. Yes. And in here, we'll create a while statement and we'll continue as long as while is true. And this is always going to be true. So this will continue infinitely. We can, of course, break out of this uh, a later point if needed. But for now, while true, we want to go ahead and spawn. And again, when, one thing I do want to mention, this here doesn't make too much logical sense because we're basically just saying loop into infinity. So be careful with these loops. If you don't put anything in here, this is going to for sure crash Unity. And that's not fun. Maybe even crash your computer. So what you want to do here is make sure to add a delay in between, in between each of these while iterations. If not, again, crashing. That's not what we want. So don't run this until we are finished writing it. Good. So basically we want to, uh, what we want to do here is spawn some fruit. And then we also want to wait. So we'll go in and say yield return new wait four seconds and we could definitely just wait a fixed amount of seconds we could wait one second spawn a fruit go back wait one second spawn a fruit and continue but it's a lot more fun if there's variance to the game so let's go up and create a public float called our min delay and we'll set that to say 0 0.1 we'll also create a public float max delay and we'll set that to say one. That's going to be a lot of fruits, but it's fun. Uh, and then down here, we don't want to wait just one second. Instead, we want to create a float called the delay and set that equal to random.range, where we get a random number between our minimum delay and our maximum delay. And then instead of waiting the one second, we wait in, according, in, uh, in accordance with that number. Then we can spawn a fruit. And we want to do this by simply calling instantiate and we are spawning our fruit. Let's actually call this the fruit prefab. I think that's more clean. And we also have to determine where we want to spawn our fruit. And we'll do that by picking a random spawn point. So to do that, we'll get an integer with the spawn index, which will set equal to random.range. 
and we'll go between zero and our spawn point dot length. Then we can get the corresponding or the spawn point corresponding to this index. So we'll create a transform called spawn point and set it equal to spawn points at the spawn index. And then we can now use that spawn point. So we are randomly getting a number between zero and the length of our spawn points array. We are then taking that index and getting an element in the spawn points array, which is going to be a random spawn point. And we're storing that in a spawn point variable. We can then set the position of our fruit prefab to our spawn point, spawn point dot position, and the rotation to spawn point dot rotation. Cool. That should actually be all for spawning fruits. Of course, we also have to make sure that we start this coroutine. So instead of our start method, we'll go start coroutine spawn fruits. There we go. Let's save that, go into Unity, and now we have to make sure to fill out these variables here. So first off, we need a fruit prefab. We'll drag in our watermelon. We also need some spawn points. So let's right click, go create empty. And this is going to be our spawn point. Let's also give this a nice little icon. And let's uh, actually duplicate this and move it over and duplicate it again and move it over to the other direction. And maybe take these two on the sides here, switch into 2D mode here and rotate them a tiny bit. So they're pointing in towards the screen. They don't just shoot up, but they will shoot kind of inwards. Now we can take all three spawn points and move them down below our screen. And we can go to our fruit spawner. We can change the size to three and we can drag in all three spawn points. Of course, I recommend creating more spawn points than this or creating some kind of um, procedural position. So you create a random position between two, uh, between two points and you create a random rotation uh, in angles that can vary by, uh, by about say 20 degrees. That's one way to do it, but I, I think spawn points is actually just fine. And especially if you add say 10 spawn points or so, no one is really going to notice that you aren't doing it procedurally uh, and that you're just picking from a list because so much is going to be going on anyways. So now we have our spawn points and our fruit spawner and we should be able to hit play. And right away, we should see these watermelons spawning from random points. However, of course, they're currently spawning down here and then just falling down. And that's not really something we want. Instead, let's go in here and let's, uh, or let's go into our fruit. And in the start method here, we want to add a force that shoots them upwards. So we'll create a reference to a rigid body, create a rigid body 2D RB. And inside of our start, we'll set RB equal to get component of type rigid body 2D. Then we can call add force on our rigid body. So RB dot add force. And we want to add a force in the direction of transform dot up. So the current upwards direction that our fruit is pointing in. That means that if the fruits get spawned down here, we want to point it this way and shoot up. If it gets spawned over here, we want to point it this way and shoot it up. That's why we're using transform that up. We then multiply this with some kind of force. And we can go up here to define that public float. And we'll call this the start force and set it equal to say 15 by default. We'll multiply with the start force here. And finally, we want to set the force mode 2D to impulse. We don't want to set it to false to force because we're not adding a force over time. We want to set it to impulse because we're only adding it once and that's in the start method. So now if we save this, go into Unity, hit play, we should see right away that our watermelons are spawning and shooting up into the screen. Yes, it's working. Awesome, man. And now we can uh, go to a fruit spawner or actually a fruit here and maybe uh, bump it down a tiny bit to start force here to say 13. Let's try that. Yeah, that's a little better. So now we can slice some fruits. That's awesome. The next thing that I want to do is just make sure that these get removed when they go outside of the screen. And we'll do that by just using a fixed timer. So after uh, spawning a fruit here, we'll get a reference to it, game object, and we'll call this the spawned fruit. 
set it equal to our instantiated object. And then we destroy the spawned fruit after say five seconds, just to make sure that it's off the screen at this point. So now we play, some fruits shoot up, we can slice them. And you can see that looking pretty good in any way that we want to. And if we let one of them escape, it should get destroyed. And indeed it does. That's awesome. One thing that isn't getting destroyed is our sliced watermelons. Let's just go ahead and clean those up as well. So inside of our fruit here, when we create some uh, sliced fruit, so game object, sliced fruit, we set that equal to our instantiated sliced fruit. We destroy sliced fruit after, uh, let's say three seconds. That should hopefully be fine. Actually, this might be a problem when we're destroying this game object as well. I don't know. Let's figure that out. Nope. Looking good. Things are getting destroyed. That's perfect. Awesome. That's pretty much all I wanted to show you in this live stream tutorial. I do think that we could play around with having these watermelons face in other directions. We definitely want some more explosiveness to slicing them, but this is the very foundation of Fruit Ninja. And I think from here, you can definitely expand upon this to make it more fun. So I hope that you enjoyed the tutorial part of this live stream, guys. And uh, unless you have any really big complaints. <laughs> I think we will kind of transition into a more Q&A type format. That means that I do have to talk even more and I'm getting really, really sore here. So I'll make sure to, to get some water going. And yeah, let's, let's shake it up. Bring me your questions, guys. And I'll probably do a bit more of slicing because this is so satisfying. Actually, let me full screen this so we can see all of the intricate detail on this rendering. This is definitely HDR, PBR, AAA workflow. Do you see how nice this is? Deferred linear rendering. Okay, cool. So questions, let's transition into chat mode. Chat mode engaged, such a nerd, cool. Let me bring this up on screen and I will try and answer whatever you throw at me. I'm glad you guys uh, like the, uh, like the tutorial. So, um, did I prepare this live stream and how long did it take me? Yes, I did. I prepared it earlier today. It took me about two hours to kind of get everything together. I always uh, kind of prepare the projects for these live streams beforehand. Um, in fact, I do that for my tutorials as well. Make sure to uh, go through all the steps, both so I know that I can th that I have a proper explanation ready, but also just to kind of minimize friction once I sit down and record. Um, let's see. Um, would I be interested in a card game tutorial? That's actually something that could be really really fun. I don't know how much. It works for a full tutorial format, but it's something that I would like to do at some point in a Ludum Diary. That could be pretty fun. Also, really sorry for not participating in the uh, in the last uh, Ludum Diary. We weren't able to attend, um, but both Sophia and I really, really wanted to do it. So I'm I'm really looking forward to the next one, which I believe is in December. I hope I can make it for that one. I don't have too many plans in December, but if it's really early December. It might be a problem, actually. Um, let me know in chat when the next uh, when the next Dudum Diary is. <laughs> I really want to do it. Um, let's see. How would I juice the fruits? Particles? Yes, lots of particles. Um, how long did it take you to get this good encoding? Thank you for thinking I'm good. Uh, I like to think that I'm I'm not really an expert, but um, uh, my current skill level, uh, I've been programming for quite a few years now. Um, programming in Unity for about six years, uh, I think is the correct answer. Um, will I teach a stealth tutorial? I don't exactly know what it is you're referring to when it comes to stealth tutorials. Please make a tutorial about car physics. Car physics is definitely on the list, but it's also just so freaking annoying to do 
I always have so many issues whenever I try to do something with cars in Unity. It never ever works unless I write it from the very bottom and that's very code intensive. So um, yeah, but it's, it's something that I've been wanting to do for sure. What tutorials am I going to make on Unity 2017.1? Well, uh, pretty much all of my future tutorials are going to be in 2017.1. So <laughs> a lot of different stuff, I hope. Um, I don't know with stuff introduced in 2017.1 particularly, but I definitely have a lot of stuff introduced with the later versions of Unity that I haven't covered yet. Uh, definitely stuff like uh, all of the new particle stuff and nav mesh is on the roadmap. Also, I am or we are currently working on a how to make good graphics in Unity video, which is kind of also how to make Unity look like Unreal, uh, where we talk about a lot of the rendering techniques that AAA games use, stuff like using deferred rendering, what it is, using uh, linear color spaces versus gamma color spaces, what that means, stuff like lighting, how you can use lighting the same way that bigger studios do, do to make your game really pop, how you use post-processing effectively, a lot of confusing around uh, confusion around HDR and tone mapping to get everything really look good, and some of the post-processing that Unreal applies by default that makes everything looks look really really good so um that's a, a video that we're we just got done um kind of doing a first draft on and we're almost i would say finishing it up uh but it's not going to be out before next month but i think in the very beginning of next month actually i think the third uh is when we'll release that if everything goes according to plan so definitely stay um stay um tuned for that how long is my hair it is this long it's very long let's do a test i'll undo it while i answer some other questions uh can i do a shader tutorial um i haven't already done one and uh that's definitely something that i also want to do i think there's a lot of it's this long to answer the question i think there's a lot uh of, of demand for uh shader tutorials out there and i think there are some good tutorials already covering the subject, probably better than what I could do. However, um, most of them are written. So I think I definitely want to do something in a video format, kind of showing how, kind of an introduction to shaders and how they work. It's just not something I've gotten around to yet, especially because I'm comfortable with writing some things in shaders, but if I have to teach it, I need to be much more comfortable. And so I would have to actually do some research myself. Um, <laughs> people talking about my hair. Uh, would you make mobile game tutorials? This is something that people have been asking me pretty much since I started the channel. And I think it's something that I've kind of been reluctant to do. The reason why is what I do now is mostly stuff that can be done for both mobile and standalone games. Effects in games, menus, different UI elements, covering basic stuff in Unity. And this is something that applies to pretty much everyone. As soon as I say this is a mobile game tutorial, there's a huge part of my following that is no longer interested. And I don't really want to divide people too much. So if I do something on mobile, it's going to be a standalone tutorial, or maybe just a two, three part series, which I would definitely be open to doing. But again, I haven't had too much experience with mobile in Unity. So I would definitely have to do some research there as well. So maybe it's on the roadmap, I think. But not in, it's not something that I've planned within the next few weeks. Um, thanks to all the people who are so thankful. <laughs> you guys are really amazing. Um, can I make a tutorial on how to make power-ups? Power-ups is something that's very specific to your game. It works in the exact same way as a collectible coin would. It's very easy. You have a collider. It's a trigger. You check if the player walks into it. And if it does, you remove the collider or power-up and you spawn some particles instead. From there on, it completely depends on your game. Because do you want to add currency? Do you want to change damage values? Do you want to change the level? Do you want to change the graphic for, of your play? What's going to happen when you collect this power up? And that's, that's, that's not really something that can be generalized. So I could definitely do something on creating a generic power up, but that would be very simple. The actual difficult part of it depends on the game. So let's say maybe. Um, I actually did a 
I worked a bit on a project recently that I really want to show you guys soon. Uh, I had some fun on it, um, which was inspired by the um, Super Smash Bros. And um, more in more in particular, what is it called? The wait, the Nintendo 64 game where you fight with different Nintendo characters. What is the name? Uh, it's escaping me. Please tell me in chat. I'm Googling as far as I can. Please. I need to know. Uh, yeah, Super, yeah, Super Smash Bros. I said it. Yeah, okay. Okay, I was thinking of my... It was inspired by Super Smash Bros. Thank you. Okay, brain fart again. And um, because I really like the idea of kind of sitting down with friends, having a controller each and kind of going against each other and battling. That was something that I thought was really fun and I wanted to create something similar because most of the games that I've been making are kind of one person, uh, one player experiences. And I also wanted to gain some more experience with using or controlling programming controller input. So that was really fun to do. Um, it doesn't have different characters, but it's basically these floaty balls that you fly around and then you shoot balls after other players. And a friend of mine wanted to call it ball wars because so many balls everywhere um, or spheres is probably the term that I should be using unless I want to be kicked off YouTube. And uh, yeah, um, that was really fun to do. And I want to show you guys um, that soon. So. I still have to do a bit of rounding up. I am actually using some cool assets from a pack that I want to get up on the asset store soon. And that's why I'm not showing it to you yet because that asset is not available. But as soon as it is, I will show you. Sorry for the teasing, we'll move on with it. How do you spell your name? <laughs> Would it really help that I told you? I mean, it's there on the screen, it's right there. <laughs> that's how you spell my name. Um, how can I place roads on a map so they are co in a coherent line? I have no idea. I'm sorry. Would you consider create a Discord channel for the community? There is already a Discord channel for the community. If you go to forum.brackies.com, I believe the top thread links to a Discord created by some awesome community members. Definitely check that out. It, it's, it, it's really fun to hang out there. I'm sorry I'm not there too often. Um, but I know a lot of people from the community are active there. It looks super fun. And I'm sure, yeah, Sophia has a link there. Good work. Awesome. <laughs> um, um, here's the Discord, blah, blah, blah. On what PC am I programming? This is a Windows computer with two Xeon processors and a, I think it's a 780 graphics card, but I don't remember. Uh, I think it has 32 big, uh, gigabit RAM uh, with 21,000 megahertz, uh, SSD. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. Um, if you want to know more about that, I do have a video on my setup that also goes through all the hard hardware specs and have them listed in the description. So if you go search for Bracky's setup video, I do have one, check that out. That's the video I use to both record, stream, I pretty much do anything on this uh, on this computer. I used to edit on it as well, but now Sophia has her video that, that we use for that instead. And we actually just built a custom one, which is super cool, this um, black and red, uh, we called it the Dragon. Super awesome custom build. Uh, we had a lot of fun building it. It was her first time kind of putting all the parts together. So that was really fun. And um, let's see. Your face is amusing. <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment. It doesn't feel like one. Uh, VR tutorial. That would require me to have some VR goggles. I currently do not have any in my possession. No, I'm sorry. Are you going to upload to YouTube? Yes. Uh, is it possible to make a shader that is transparent and have shadows? Yes. Um, let's see. Can you make a tutorial on a realistic ammunition system? No. <laughs> um, I already have a tutorial on shooting and adding ammo. And I don't think we're going to go much further than that. I think it sounds something that's too narrow um, for a tutorial, at least for now. 
Will you continue with the multiplayer series? I'm sorry, I will not continue with the multiplayer series. Uh, it is where it is. Uh, I saw way too much demand for this stuff. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry if you're sad about it, but uh, uh, that's just uh, how it is. Um, would you make a platform game like Little Big Planet? I mean, 2.5D kind of game. That's exactly what I just did with the Super Smash thing. Uh, it's it's also 3D. It's platforming, and it's th you have three jumps. Uh, there's lots of weapons, and there's lava. Everything's so. Ah, I wish I could show you this. Uh, can you make a Subnautica replica? That's it's maybe um it's maybe a pretty good deer. Um, yeah, maybe maybe some point. Uh, but it's pretty content heavy. I feel and 3D, so probably. Maybe. Uh, can you do a Monument Valley, Valley replica? Now that's a cool game. Don't feel it like it's something that can pretty easily be replicated either. Um, looking for more simple stuff, I think. Um, there are AI tutorials coming. Yes, they are in the making. Yeah, that's what I can say. <laughs> um, this is the last time I'm saying this, I feel bad for spamming, but that's never a good thing to start a message with. Can you make a stealth game where you can sneak by a person who can either detect you by sight or sound with sneak skill on player and perception on the person or blah, 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 blah. Okay, I see what you get there. Um, this, this kind of stealth behavior um, is something that, again, is dependent on how your game works. Is it 2D or 3D? Is it what's the angle of the camera? How do you handle stats? All of these different things. If you want to learn about um, this kind of advanced AI in terms of smell perception, sight perception, these different things, I would definitely recommend you check out Rain Indie and uh, their uh, by Rival Theory. Um, they have a lot of more advanced stuff when it comes to AI. It's an AI solution and it has built into it some of these more human characteristics. And they have support for Unity. I haven't checked it out in a long time, but I know at least a few years ago, this was the place to be if you wanted to really emulate realistic human-like characters in AI. Cool. Um, can you make a tutorial on a 3D space game? Oh, that would be so cool. I really want to do some more space stuff. I did the, um, I did the gravity simulation tutorial, if you haven't seen it yet. That was so much fun. I love simulating uh, things in gravity in Unity, especially because I think you can get it to look so beautiful if you just use the right shaders and some simple lighting, a bit of post-processing. Man, it's so good. Um, yeah, uh, I, I would love to. <laughs> Will you continue the C-sharp beginner series? Not right now. I don't see much need to uh, delve into more advanced subjects, but at some point I might pick it up again. Some, peeing, uh, some people are saying that it already needs a remake. That might be something to do at some point. But I think right now it stands fine as is. Um, are you going to make a dynamic nav mesh tutorial? Yes. Um, why do you use get mouse down and get mouse up instead of get mouse? Same with buttons. Because get mouse down allows you to then enable something right when something is clicked. Get mouse down allows you to do the opposite. Get mouse just does, does something every single frame. And so you have to check if it's already enabled, don't do it again, blah, blah, blah. You have to add extra logic. That's why I use those. Can you make another FPS multiplayer series with Unity 2017? I love the first one, but it has some problems in Unity 2017, I could imagine. Um, I would le definitely love to do something with multiplayer again. If I do, it's probably not going to be another FPS series, but I definitely do want to cover some more UNET stuff, especially because I haven't checked it out lately, and I hope that a lot of the stuff that was driving me absolutely crazy the first time has been fixed. That would be really, really nice. Um, I had so many issues, and that series was so hard to make because a lot of the stuff that I wanted to cover hadn't been written about almost at all. <clears throat> so I was figuring out everything on pretty sparse and I'm just going to say bad documentation, um, which was not easy. So doing something with uh, networking again in the future would definitely be, uh, be fun. And I think I could do something more informative and uh, scalable than what we did. Um, can you do a tutorial about projectile 
uh, trajectory with a line renderer using an angle, bullet speed, bullet weight, and start position. That is something that could be fun. And I definitely wanted to do some more advanced shooting stuff at some point. So I'll keep that in mind. It's always something that I've been wanting to do. Mm. Battleship tutorial. That is actually not a bad idea. Thanks for suggesting that. Can I do a tutorial about inverse kinematics? That could be fun. Really math heavy. I actually... Oh, something says to me that Sebastian has a video on inverse kinematics, but I'm not going to promise you anything. So I would definitely go to his channel and, and look. But I'm sorry if he doesn't and it's just me brain farting. Sorry, guys. All right. I think that is pretty much all of the stuff that we're going to be able to cover in this live stream. I'm sorry, but I think we're going to round it off now before I completely lose my voice. And also we have to kind of get on with um, uh, processing the recording and uh, uploading everything. And I also have to get the project up. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's time to wrap it up, uh, to, to wrap it up. But uh, thanks so much for tuning in, guys. I had a lot of fun as always. These live streams are, they're just amazing to do because the amount of support that you give is just, it's amazing. It's, it, it makes this piece of work really, really fun. So I'm really thankful for that. Thank you so much, everyone. If you want to support these videos and the live streams, you can go to patreon.com slash I see a lot of new supporters coming recently. That's really awesome. Thank you so much for your support. It's a really nice community to be part of. So if you want to join, you can go right now to patreon.com slash with a monthly donation of your choosing. Cancel it at any time if you want to. Um, it's just a really, really good way to kind of keep everything going. So thank you so much, guys. I'll see you soon. Thanks for watching. Have a lot of fun. Bye. Thanks to all of the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in July. And a special thanks to Hans Huftun, Derek Heemskirk, Faisal Marify, Jesper Mikkelsen, Stone Gamer, Thomas Voli, Cyborg Mummy, Cole Cabral, Jason Latito, Aaron, Robert Bund, and Judaman. If you want to become a Patreon yourself, you can do so at patreon.com slash You guys rock.